Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Trevor Bauer Show, a late episode of Trevor Bauer Show, as I've had some technical difficulties this week and haven't had enough time to film and refilm and figure out the tech and then film and then just, it's been a mess. But I'm coming to you today late because we have a lot to discuss. I'm going to jump right into it and not waste any time. The first thing we have to talk about is the Mets, Hot Mike, and Rob Manfred and that whole situation. Uh, we've learned recently hot mics, hot mics can be dangerous. Um, I think you would hope that people would conduct themselves as, as if there was a hot mic at all times. Um, you would hope that the people that are you know, speaking to you when the mic is on uh, are giving a true representation of, of who they are uh, and not some false narrative or false perception of it and then they're really different when you hear them when they don't think the mic is on uh and i think that's kind of what you what you got here is a little bit of a little bit of that you know people speaking saying something that they wouldn't normally say publicly um but the the mic was on so for those who haven't heard that i don't know who hasn't heard about what happened it was all over twitter uh basically brody van wagenen the the mets gm there was a, a hot mic and on video. Um, I'm not sure if it was in the interview room where the the Zoom call is uh, lie. I, I'm not sure. I'm not because you know with COVID we have to we go to the interview room and they're they're doing it by Zoom. But sometimes you don't realize that the audio is on or the, the camera's on and you're just sitting there talking and and it's broadcasting via a private Zoom link or something like that. So I'm not sure if that's what happened or if it was in the interview room or what. But he's basically discussing. You know, the, the Mets team, the Mets players wanted to show solidarity with uh, the rest of, or not the, maybe not the rest of the league, but with the teams in the league who were sitting out a game, who were protesting the, the stuff going on in Wisconsin. Uh, so the Mets didn't want to play that game. And uh, it sounds like, you know, uh, Manfred wanted the Mets to take the field, symbolically leave the field at 7-10, uh, come back an hour later and play. The, the Mets organization didn't really understand if the, if the players didn't want to play, why their organization, their players, would have to then go back and play when other organizations hadn't played and those games had been, had been postponed or, or rescheduled or whatever. Uh, and at the end, Brody you know, was saying something like, yeah, you know, Rob Manfred at the leadership level just doesn't get it, uh, which you know, I think is kind of a sentiment that, is held amongst some people. Um, certainly, you know, members of, of the player group feel that way. Certainly, members of the fan group uh, feel that way. I'm sure members of um, different organizations feel that way as well, as is the case with anybody. I mean, you're never going to have 100% approval, right? Um, so while Manfred's leadership style might work for some, uh, it definitely doesn't work for others. And I think that's a little bit of what you were kind of hearing in that video is that that the leadership style or maybe lack of leadership, I don't know, I'm not involved in all the discussions that go on on the team level, but uh, maybe that lack of leadership from Rob Manfred was being, there's a little frustration uh, coming out from Brody. And these are the moments, these are the conversations that happen behind closed doors, but usually they stay behind closed doors. Uh, and this one just was, was hot, you know, the mic was hot. So it became public, it was all over Twitter. Not a good look. I've seen a couple different things that I wanted to jump into. One, the conspiracy theory that the Mets had the mic hot and produced this video uh, on purpose uh, in order to, I guess the, the thought there is that they, would tr they were trying to get Rob fired or something. I'm not sure. I don't subscribe to that at all. I don't think that there was a conspiracy. I don't think it was planned. Uh, I think it was just a situation where a private conversation was took place, happened to take place in front of a hot mic, uh, being in those interview rooms and stuff like that. I've I've had multiple conversations this year about like, hey, just be careful when you go in that room. Like sometimes the mics are on, sometimes whatever. Uh, so I think that's what happened. So the conspiracy theory to me, out. Um, the next one is that this is a bad look and that Rob Manfred's job may be in jeopardy here. I don't think so. I don't think it, that his job is in jeopardy. Uh, for those who don't know, the owners vote 
uh, on the commissioner. They have to they cast their votes, and I'm not sure exactly what the percentage is. If it's just a majority of owners, or if it's a two thirds majority, or something like that, to vote in uh, a commissioner. I'm assuming it's the same type of thing to vote out a commissioner. And I got to imagine the the group that voted Rob in um, has seen their franchise value increase. They've seen the league revenues increase. And while we do have problems as an industry, while there is a, I believe there, you're running towards a cliff as an industry, not attracting young fans and some of the decisions being made and the tension that's been created through you know lack of communication between the, the PA and MLB and the league side. Um, while well, I think we're running towards a cliff, I think that the overall league revenues are high enough and the values of the franchises are increasing enough and things are good enough on the owner side that this little you know, public relations guffaw uh, isn't going to put Rob's job in jeopardy. Uh, so I've definitely, I've definitely heard that one. And then the, other, the last point on this is that I just, at some point, I guess, and this is kind of going to lead me into my next point, at some point you have to, uh, you have to make a decision how you're going to run your organization, your league. And if you're going to be okay with players expressing themselves, then you need to always be okay with players expressing themselves. And if you're not going to be okay with players expressing themselves, then you need to always be that way. Um, this is a situation where I think the, the Brewers kind of started it in baseball. The, the Brewers started this the the kind of like we're gonna we're not gonna play tonight we don't feel like as a team we should be playing baseball in light of whatever else is going on uh so they started it and then that was okay that that happened um and then they didn't have they, they weren't asked to play the game there was no symbolic moment there was no come back to the field or anything like that so if you're going to be okay with that as a league then you need to be okay with it when the other teams do the same thing, regardless if they're in New York, if they're in uh, Miami, Seattle, Houston. It doesn't matter where they are. Like you have to be, you have to handle it the same way. Otherwise, people are going to start questioning, like, well, why was it okay over there and, and not okay over here? So I think that's a little bit of what what's going on there, and this kind of contrived uh, PR stunt or or statement that it seems like. Uh, and there's been some some reports, I guess, of uh, it, it was miscommunicated or whatever. But it seems like this kind of contrived PR stunt was coming from the league office from Rob saying, "This is what we want you to do." Well, if the other teams haven't done it, you can't you can't have a double standard there. Right? You can't be okay with players stepping up and voicing their opinion on on one side of an issue, but not on another side of an issue. You can't you gotta you gotta treat the situations the same. You gotta have a set of of rules, you have to have a, a, some boundaries and and stuff like that that you you stick by, so that when a situation arises, like you know how you're going to handle it, so it's handled fairly or what people would perceive to be fairly across all the different situations. So that's my take on uh, on the on the Manfred hot mic Brody Van Wagenen situation. Not a conspiracy theorist on this one. Rob's job is not in jeopardy. I don't think. I do think it was botched a little bit in not having a set understanding of exactly how you're going to handle a situation like that and then handling it that way across uh, all the across the entire league and, and every situation that comes up. But that leads directly into the next point, which was the Brewers players decided not to play a game. And the Reds were playing. We were in, we were in Milwaukee for that. Um, the way it happened is I think the Bucks players the night before chose not to play. Uh, and the, they, they boycotted the, um, I guess this is the fifth game of their, uh, of their playoff series. And so the next day we show up to the field and there's questions of whether we're going to play or not because the Brewers players are having these discussions. And, and so they, I guess, at some point came to the decision they were not going to play, that they did not feel comfortable playing. Um, and so some of their players came over kind of towards our dugout and some of our players came out. You know, Mustak has played over there last couple of years, so he knows players on the team. All, you know, players kind of know each other nowadays. Everyone talks. Everyone's got friends on different teams and stuff like that. So uh, there was a small group of players from the Brewers and from the, the Reds that kind of met there and, and discussed some things, and the Brewer players informed us that we were not going to play and, or that, that you know, they weren't going to play. So then the situation became basically that 
we didn't have an opponent to play, so our organization had to had to figure out, I guess, if we were going to accept the forfeit loss, or if we were going to then, I guess, pull out. I don't know exactly that that exactly how the technicalities of it work, but what ended up happening is that we, as an organization, chose uh, to not accept the forfeit loss and to just push the game back. Uh, but it did put us in kind of an odd situation because now instead of scheduling it for later in the year when the Brewers came to our place and we would make it up down the line, we scheduled it for the next day. So then we had a doubleheader on Thursday. We ended up getting in to Cincinnati because it was a travel day. We ended up getting into Cincinnati at like, I didn't make it back to my apartment until like 3.30. Um, we had a game tonight against the Cubs, doubleheader tomorrow against the Cubs. So we have now five games in three days. That's tough to handle, even with the seven, uh, the seven inning double headers this year, and that was something that you know that that I guess maybe we didn't have a, a choice in the matter. I'm not sure exactly what what went on and why it was scheduled that way. So that's one side of things. The other side of things is you know the Brewer players deciding not to play, and this kind of goes back to the leadership style that uh, that I talked about with with Rob. And I think that uh, if you're going to be okay with the players voicing their opinions, then you need to stand behind that. And so in this situation, this first situation with the Brewers and the Reds, they did stand behind that. The players were able to to voice their opinion. They stood up as a group. The Brewers players stood up as a group and said, this is what we we feel comfortable doing. And there are things bigger than baseball that, that that we value more than baseball, that we're gonna set baseball aside for today and we're gonna spend time I guess, talking about, thinking about, being active with the situation that was going on. Um, and so that is, is good, and I think that that's how it should work. My personal opinion on the whole thing is that I support every single player standing up for whatever cause it is that they feel good about, that they want to go and champion, uh, that they feel passionate about trying to make change with, how, whatever it is, whether it's a charity, whether it's a social movement like this, whether it's... Um, you know, a certain disease that they're, that they're uh, passionate about trying to get rid of and, and address. Whatever the, the situation is, I think each individual player should feel empowered to use the platform of being a big league ball player to try to make the changes that they would like to see or to try to address the issues that they would like to see. I don't think the league itself should have an opinion on things one way or the other. And this is why. Before you start calling me callous and and a racist or or whatever the case is you got to hear me out i don't think the league should have a voice on an issue one way or the other because i think a lot more good can come from the individual players standing up for what they believe in as opposed to the league the league if the league takes side a of an issue they're going to alienate everyone that feels strongly about side b if they take side B, similarly, they alienate everyone that feels strongly about side A. So assuming that whatever issue we're talking about is split 50-50, you get 50% Democrat, 50% Republican. You got 50% in favor of a DH, 50% not in favor of a DH. Whatever, the, whatever the, the issue is, when the league comes out and takes a stance on it, you alienate 50% of the people. So now there are less people that are interested in watching your league, which means there are less eyes on the product, less eyes on the player, which means the industry itself suffers and the player voice also suffers. Less people watching, less people caring about what baseball players have to say, less influence that the baseball players can have. So if the league stays agnostic and doesn't take a side on anything, and allows the players to speak up in whichever direction they want. You have to, you have to create an environment that's, that, that allows for that. You have to create a culture that encourages people to stand up, and then you have to stand behind them when they do stand up on both sides of the issues. But if you do that, then I think a lot more good can come for all these individual causes because you have individual players speaking about it. Now, there's a reason that athlete endorsements are a thing because the general public tends to listen to athletes. They know the athlete, they trust them in, in some sense because they see them play, they feel like they know them, whatever the case is. Hey, if it's good for him, he's a professional athlete, it's gotta be good for me, that type of thing. 
And that goes for advertisers. You see this all the time, an athlete advertising for Nike or for Adidas. You see car commercials for the local dealership. You see Budweiser. You see it goes on and on because when athletes speak about something, it matters to the public. And this has been proven over and over and over. So the more you can give the athletes a platform to speak on these issues, the better off you're going to be, the more change and the more good can come from it. And I don't think alienating 50% of the population, the 50% of your fan base and reducing the platform that athletes have to speak out is a good tactic for the league to take. So that's my opinion on, on that whole situation. Should we have played? Should we have not played? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't have an, a strong opinion on it one way or the other because at, at the point that the information got to me, I, there wasn't really a choice because the Brewers players had already decided they weren't going to play and I, we didn't have an opponent to play. So we, we couldn't play even if we had wanted to. So it was kind of a non-issue. I never really like got my head around exactly what uh, we, you know I, sh I wanted to do or not because this is just what was presented to me. But those are my thoughts on, on the situation um, specifically relating to you know the games being postponed and moved back and all that different stuff. So that brings me into some on-field baseball stuff. Lucas Giolito threw a no-hitter. Uh, pretty cool. They don't happen very often. Um, they're always special when they do. 13 punch outs and only threw about 100 pitches. So he was just in the strike zone all night long with really swing and miss stuff. Um, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it back. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Um, but I'm going to watch it and just see kind of what – what he did, because I, I like studying greatness. I like watching, you know, these these special moments. And, you know, I've, I've gotten a chance to speak with Lucas a couple times. He's a great dude from what I know of him. And, like, knowing his kind of history, he grew up in Southern California. He was this, you know, really top prospect and then struggled for a little bit, uh, kind of got beat up his first uh, year. I think there's a couple partial years up and down in the big leagues where he got kind of beat up. I think... Actually, I think he was one of the worst, if not the worst, statistical pitchers one year, and he came back what would be now be, I think, last year and was one of the best. And so watching athletes be able to, everyone says figure it out, you know, but it's, it's watching him put all the pieces together, watching him make the necessary changes. I guess it's the process of figuring it out. It's do I need to change my delivery? Do I need to shorten up my arm action length? My arm? Do I need a new pitch? Is it a mental thing that I'm not – focused in the first inning or I like I'm whatever the case is watching him put the pieces together and then go out there and like see the see the results and see the success is is something that I'm really interested in because it's it's high performance it's achievement and that's what drives me and I I, I can use that information so it was really awesome to see Lucas you know do that um and like I said I haven't been able to watch it yet so I'm going to go back and watch it I'll probably do a breaking point on it so that'll be coming in the next couple of days hopefully um just to kind of break down what what I see from, from that start, but, uh, 13 strikeouts, no hitter, lots of, I think 30 swings and misses maybe, which is a ton of, like basically one third of the pitches he threw, uh, were swung at and missed, which is, which is crazy. So big moment for baseball. I think it's a, I think it's sweet. I'm glad it wasn't a seven inning, no hitter. I'm glad it, I'm glad we don't have to have the discussion of whether it counts or doesn't count. Um, while that would be good cause it would be all over you know, the talk shows and stuff like that. It'd be good for baseball. Uh, I'm glad Lucas just had a chance to, to do it and, and to finish it off in a completely, uh, I guess, what you, what you would consider a normal game. I do feel bad for the White Sox fans that <laughs> weren't able to be at the stadium to experience that moment because it's something that people talk about for a long time. I was at this game when this happened, and no one can say that they were at the game when Lucas Giolito threw a no hitter. So really, really cool stuff on that front. Um, and like I said, you know, good, good guy. James McCann was catching it. Uh, another, another guy I've gotten to know. Okay. I spent a little bit of time with him, um, this spring training and we talked a little bit and another really solid human being. So, um, happy for, happy for those two guys and for their team. Awesome for baseball. Um, when we were in Milwaukee, uh, we played, and I took my first loss of the season. Uh, I'm trying to be better this year about handling losses and not getting too down. 
on myself. I'm trying to celebrate my wins more and not get so down on losses. So I think I actually did a pretty good job uh, of that. I, I didn't get super down. Usually after I lose, it's like this crushing like this crushing feeling. I come home, I can't sleep, I'm miserable, I can't, I don't talk to anybody. Um, if I do talk to someone, I'm very snappy and like depressed. The next day I go to the field, I don't feel like I belong there. I don't feel like I'm, I should be around. I feel like I let my teammates down. I feel like it's just, I'm miserable. I didn't sleep, I don't sleep well the night after I pitch. So I'm just like down. Plus I didn't sleep well. Plus, and so it's just this long, like, 24 to 36 hour miserable cycle for me. So I'm trying to be better about that this year, I'm trying to celebrate my wins more so I maintain a higher level of happiness and so it's easier to just brush off a small dip. And I actually did a pretty good job of that. Obviously it sucks to lose. Um, we've done that this year as a team more than we've won, uh, which sucks, but I think I did an okay job of it. But anyway, took the loss. However, I was able to strike out I believe nine people. I got the five requisite strikeouts to set the new Cincinnati record for most strikeouts through five appearances in a season, which netted us some buds. We got the Cincinnati buds cans. Uh, I, those just got shipped into the field. They are there in my locker. Um, interesting on that, I guess there's some regulations with beer companies. I don't know anything about, about this. Uh, I guess there's some regulations with alcohol and beer companies that uh, they can only print so many cans before they get them approved, and the approval process is kind of long. So as it stands right now, I think we only have 12 cans, 10 or 12 cans, uh, but hoping to get more of those in uh, and hoping to see them go public because there's a lot of people in Cincinnati that would love them because the Cincinnati Buds are 3-0 and as I'm recording this right now. Since we rebranded ourselves, since the players decided that we're going to be the Cincinnati Buds, we have not lost. We're 3-0. So that was a pretty cool moment. I drew B-U-D-S in the back of the mound. One letter for each strikeout. And then on the fifth one that broke the record, a nice little line underneath it. Drank a nice little beer, virtual beer on the mound. Um, it was a cool moment. We got some shirts coming out, Cincinnati Buds on them. We got, it's a, it's a cool thing. Uh, we're doing it through trevorbauer.com. We got some shirts coming out soon. Uh, Budweiser's jumping on the shirt game. There's a bunch of other people around Cincinnati jumping in on the shirt game. Uh, it's going to be a cool thing for our team and a cool thing to engage the players and the fans and uh, just mesh those two together, which is something I'm passionate about. And I think it really helps the, I, I think it helps the team. I think the more you're engaged with your fan base and the more everyone in the city is kind of together and pulling for each other, I think it's a good thing. So that was one positive that came from the game, even though we lost. Had the doubleheader on Sunday and swept both games of the doubleheader. No, not Sunday, Thursday. Swept both games of the doubleheader. So we got out of Milwaukee with a split, even though we lost the first two. We need a big homestand right now. We took the first one against the Cubs tonight. We got three more over the next two days and need to get back on track. But that's the, that's the deal on that one. Um, a couple life updates before we go on. Um, I closed on an investment property. Got that handled. Had, a, had to get a notary to come to St. Louis to meet me in the lobby. We had a little bit of a guffaw on the documents being delivered. The documents were set to be delivered at 1030 in the morning, but the meeting was set for 10 o'clock in the morning. So when we met in the lobby, he's like, hey, do you have the papers? I'm like, no, I thought you had them. He goes, no, they said that you had them. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I don't, I don't know. So I went to the front desk and nothing had been delivered. And we had to call the title company. Well, I called my realtor and she called the title company. And then the title company and then the whole, and we were off by half an hour. So eventually the papers get delivered. Notary guy comes back, sign all the papers, did this, you know, kind of remotely. Normally you would go into the title office, you'd sit down, they'd explain everything to you. You'd sign, it's a big, everyone's like happy. And then you'd change the deed and all the different stuff. But this time did it on the road, met the guy at the hotel, went smoothly. So that was kind of cool, but I'm now the proud owner of a storage facility um, in Texas. A, uh, a third one, I think, second or third one. Um, so investments are are going right, you know, going pretty well. Um, storage facilities are interesting investment. I know most of you aren't here to hear me talk about investments, but uh, they're one of my they're one of the things that that makes sense for me and and how I'm 
kind of organizing my finances and separating some money off to be in the risky category, which is like my business ventures, and some to be in the conservative category, which is your physical property and uh, some you know storage storage sheds, houses, residential, commercial stuff like that, and then some kind of in the middle, which is in the market, some more conservative in the market, some a little bit more risky in the market. And so I, I try to kind of balance out the spectrum a little bit. So that was kind of a cool thing. First time I've done a closing on the road, which was kind of cool. Um, and it was my mom's birthday. So I have to give a shout out to Kathy Bauer. I love you, mom, if you're watching this. Um, big, <laughs> big shout out to you. Happy birthday. I know we talked a little bit on your birthday. I wish we could have spent it together. Uh, normally I would, you know, Normally that's a possibility this year with COVID. It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to, to travel and can't come to the games and all that stuff. So some of our uh, routines and um, some of the fun that we get to have together on your birthday is not possible this year. But I love you. and uh, Thank you for everything that you've done for me, that you continue to do for me, being an eternal source of positivity and support in my life. Um, so happy birthday and look forward to another year of <laughs> late night, late night giggles and, and jokes and fun and random positive text messages that brighten my day and, and all the, all the different things you do for me. So thanks mom. Um, next up would be a rant of the week. I don't really have a rant of the week this week. Uh, I don't have anything that I, that I really Nothing, nothing really, it was kind of a smooth, kind of smooth sailing this week in my, in my world. I don't have a, I don't have something that I'm, you know, that I have a strong opinion on. So we're going to skip rant of the week this week. I'm sure I'll have a rant of the week next week. I generally, I generally have some, but uh, this week, no, no real rants, which means that we're going to jump right into week tweets and we got a couple week tweets. Favorite segment, the weakest of the the weakest of the tweets I received this week. We only got a couple weak tweets this week uh, because most people were talking about the Budweiser celebration, and so even though I lost a game, usually when you lose a game on Twitter, there's some really weak tweets that come your way. A lot of people have an opinion, but no one even really talked about the fact that I lost because everyone was talking about the Budweiser celebration. So kind of an interesting thing. Um, you do something that's clippable that's short and gets shared a bunch. I think one of the videos of me doing it has like 700,000 views or something like that. And that dominates the narrative of the game. And so all the negativity kind of just gets washed out and erased by all the people sharing positive thoughts about the little clippable moment. So kind of a revelation for me might do something like that every game now or some hope something like that to get some clippable moments out there so that I don't hear as many of the internet trolls. But with that being said, we have some weak tweets. First weak tweet, quote, have to love a teammate playing for the name on the back of his jersey rather than the front. At least he didn't chuck the ball into the bleachers. Okay, so the assumption here is that by me celebrating something, I'm playing for myself. I think that's the assumption there, uh, playing for the name on the back of the jersey rather than the front except for the fact that this is like a whole team thing. Like it was something that was bringing all the team together. Like I was talking to my teammates about it for a couple different weeks. Everyone was fired up about the Cincinnati buds thing. We were all coming up with like, what celebration should we do? And so this is actually something that brought the team together that the whole team was playing together for. Uh, there's a little bit of competition between me and Sonny. So some, some friendly, like, you know, shit talking back and forth, uh, the, brings teammates closer together. There's people wondering if we're going to do it. Me and Kurt, we're like locked in on the same page, like got to get those cans. So this is actually something that was not me playing for me. It was me playing for the team. So the fact that you think that I was playing for the name on the back instead of the name on the front couldn't be further from the truth. So that part's weak. And then at least he didn't chuck the ball into the bleachers. Well, that's just so old and stale. I mean, I already, I already came out, apologized for it. Then I make fun of myself for it routinely. I have a shirt that I sell on trevorbauer.com that says send it, making fun of the moment. I also made fun of the moment in Kansas City when I threw a one-hitter and we won. 
And so coming back and trying to use it like it's an insult is like, what? It's like Eminem in 8 Mile when he disses himself. Like you can't, you hand the mic to the other person, you can't say anything. You don't have anything left to say. So that was just a really weak tweet. A really weak tweet. Okay, the next one. We only have two this week. Only found two. All you internet trolls out there slacking. Anyway, this one comes from a verified account, actually. Verified account. Lots of verified accounts out there send some really weak tweets. It's pretty interesting. Anyway, it says, uh, I see, good for him, I guess, can't spell team without me, right? Uh, How weak is that? Again, same exact reaction, like, except this dude's a verified account. Making the assumption that I'm playing for myself instead of this is a team-wide thing. Uh, we talked about it as teammates and all the different stuff. So, I don't know, just opining about stuff that you have no idea about, which apparently the blue check mark on Twitter gives you the right to just know everything about every situation. John Heyman abuses that all the time. Oh, I heard this and I know that. I'm like, John, you don't know anything. You haven't heard anything. Uh, same thing with this. Um, John Heyman is not the person who sent that tweet. Not naming names here uh, on the people who send the weak tweets. But come on, man. Really? Playing from, you know, can't spell team without me? Uh, yeah. Guess you just don't know what goes on in our clubhouse. Shocker, you're not in our clubhouse. How would you? So weak tweet. Number two of the week. That's all. That's all the weak tweets from this week. Uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty more. We're playing the cl- we're playing the Cubs, and they love to send drone jokes. So I'm assuming I'm going to have a bunch of drone joke mentions tomorrow when I before my start. It'll be great. But uh, actually, speaking of that, it's getting a little bit late. It's now 12:14 at the time of this filming. So I got to go get some sleep as soon as my little treatment here is done, and I'm going to leave it at that. So I'll see you guys in the next video. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do that now. I'd really appreciate it. Help me on my way to 100,000 subs by the end of 2020. We're getting there. We're chugging right along. I appreciate all of you. Uh, Leave me a comment. Leave me a like. Share this video if you feel so inclined. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Have a good night.